Good evening, everybody. My name is Samuel Soto. I'm a student physical therapist from Dominican College. And today I'm going to be talking about return to sport following anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction, also known as ACL reconstruction. So some background information about ACL reconstructions. So there's about 120,000 ACL reconstruction surgeries done every single year in the United States of America. The incidence of ACL injury has been on the rise, and specifically amongst the um, young athlete population. Um, and even more specifically, females, young females, tend to have a higher incidence of ACL tears. This could be due to hormonal differences between men and women, um, which can cause some laxity in the ligaments. And also women have wider pelvises, and that can cause a greater Q angle and put more stress onto the knee joint as well as smaller, smaller bony attachment sites for females. So there's different grafts that can be used. You can have an autograft or an allograft. Um, I'm gonna specifically, specifically gonna be talking about uh, patellar bone grafts or semitendinosus gracilis grafts, which are considered autografts, in which the surgeon uses um, tissue from the same person um, to harvest a graft and ultimately use it as an ACL. So first I want to talk about the topic of ligamentization. So ligamentization are, is the changes in the biological and mechanical properties of the healing graft in its intraarticular region. So there's three different phases when it comes to ligamentization. The first phase is called the early graft healing phase. And what happens is, you know, after the ACL surgery, once that graft is in place, what happens is there's a, a necrosis that happens in the center of the graft and a reduction in cells to that graft. So once this necrosis happens, the body starts to release uh, cytokines like tumor necrosis factor, interleukins, um, as well as chemokines that kind of cause a cascade of growth, right? So growth factors are going to be expressed here, and this is going to lead to a migration of cells, and it's going to lead to our next phase, which is the proliferation phase. So the next phase uh, happens around the 4th and 12th post-operative week. I, do, I just want to quickly mention that first early graft phase happens between, you know, between the time of surgery and the fourth week. And then we get into the proliferation phase. So what happens now is that we have a maximum amount of cellular activity and changes in that extracellular matrix. After this, you know, after the 12th week or three months, we start the ligamentization process, which can take even years after the surgery. So most people think that, you know, once an athlete has returned to sport, that their graft is completely healed. But in reality, the research has shown us that, you know, certain changes still occur even years after reconstruction. And actually some studies show that that graft is never going to be exactly the same or exactly as strong as your intact ACL. So those are things to take into account when returning an athlete to sport. So in the ligamentization process, there's a vascularity throughout the graft that tends to decrease and return to values of the intact ACL. So vessels become evenly distributed throughout the entire graft between six and 12 months, which is when athletes tend to, you know, kind of return to sport. So some pictures here showing the revascularization during graft healing, as I said, um, around the six week mark, that's going to be your proliferation phase. So you can clearly see the uh, hypervascularity, right? So maximum cellular activity happening here on six weeks, 12 weeks as well. And then after that, during the ligamentization process, we have a reduction in, um, in vascularity and starts to resemble more of that intact ACL. So return to sport rates are going to be higher when the patient is a male, when they're younger age. You know, our body heals faster when we're younger. That's, that's true. Also, when the time interval between the actual injury and the surgery takes place. So whenever we delay surgery, you know, we have a torn ACL and we delay surgery, our outcomes are going to be a lot you know, worse than, than if we limit that time between the initial injury and surgery. So return to, return to sport rates are going to be higher when a hamstring tendon autograft is used. However, there's a study that came out recently showing that, you know, 2.1% 2.1 times more likely to need a revision 
when using a hamstring tendon autograft compared to patella tendon. So although you can get on the field faster, you're twice as likely to get to need a revision. So essentially, what's the point of going back so soon if you're just gonna have to get, you know, you're you're twice as likely to get another surgery. So this is something I'm gonna be talking a, lot, a little bit more about in greater detail further on. Also, when there's a strong positive psychological response, you know, when our when our athletes and our patients are you know, they're mentally strong and they're mentally motivated to get back on the field, they're going to have a higher return to sport rate, you know. i also get into that a little bit more later on. So just in general, we do want to follow a biopsychosocial approach when it comes to return to sport. So yes, there's injury characteristics. Yes, you have a torn ACL, you got the reconstruction, you know, you have physical factors like you have decreased knee strength, you have, you know, maybe a some swelling, you know, but we also have to take into account the psychological factors, you know, their psychological readiness to return to sport. Are our athletes motivated? Do they feel confident landing? Do they feel confident returning to their teams? Also take into account the social and contextual factors, you know, the pr external pressures from schools, you know, you know, if you don't play, you might lose your scholarship, things like that we need to take into account. And all these things essentially go back into functional performance and return to sport decision. So when it comes to return to sport, what does that mean? So in 2016, there was a meeting where a few experts met in Switzerland at a conference and they came to agreement with different terms uh, and terminologies when it comes to return to sport. So when it comes to return to sport, you're not just going from the rehab clinic into your sport. You know, it's a, a continuum and it's a continuum of three elements. The first one is return to participation. The next one is going to be a return to sport. And the last one's going to be a return to performance. So diving a little bit deeper into this continuum, the first part that happens is, yes, you get injured, you know, and you start your road to recovery. The next is the return to participation. So no, we're not throwing our athletes into a competitive game. You know, we're essentially allowing our athletes to train, but they're not ready to return to actual game shape, right? So after this, then they can actually return to sport but it's not like they're performing at the level that they want to. You know, they know how they were performing pre-injury, but now they're pretty much performing, but they're not at the level of that they desire to be at. The next stage is going to be our return to performance. That's really going to be where our athlete returns to sport and is performing at or above their pre-level of injury. So also at this conference, they came up with a framework. It's called the START Framework. And essentially, it looks at, you can see here, it stands for Strategic Assessment of Risk and Risk Tolerance. So essentially, it's a framework where you can pick and choose and monitor specific aspects of the return to play decision. So we can see here in step one, it's an assessment of their health risk. So we're really looking at their tissue health. How, and how much, you know, how is their tissue? How is the ACL? How is the quad? How is, you know, do they have any swelling? Do they have any positive special tests? What's their symptoms like? Are their knees giving away or giving out when they're landing, when they're, you know, performing a squat? Well, patient demographics, what's their age, you know? So these are things you want to monitor. In step two, we have an assessment of activity risk, right? So we want to look at the tissue stresses and, and the loading of the tissue. So we want to know what type of sport do they play, right? So our treatment is going to be different for, you know, a soccer goalie in comparison to a basketball point guard. You know, every patient's going to need uh, a different set of skills to carry over to their training and to their, to their team. So we want to look at competitive level, you know, are, there, are they going to be going back to the playoffs? Are they going to be, you know, are they D3 or are they D1? You know, what level are they playing at? Um, do they have any protection, paddings, things like that? And this is what, where we want to incorporate our functional tests, right? We want to see can those tissues accept that load? So we use our functional tests, which I'll get into later, like our hop tests. We also want to look at psychological readiness and essentially when we perform our risk assessment tolerance with the first two steps, we want to make sure that that falls under our assessment of risk tolerance, right? So step three is going to be our risk tolerance modifiers. So these are, th these are those external factors that can influence a return to play decision. So a lot of the times, you know, with, our, with physical therapy education, they focus a lot on the first two steps. But here we really want to focus on also the step, the third step, which is 
you know, we want to look at the pressure from the athlete. We want to look at, you know, other coaches and their family kind of pushing them and pressuring them into returning. We want to make sure that the patient isn't masking the injury because they want to be able to get back onto that field to not lose that scholarship. We also want to make sure that there's no conflict of interest or any fear of litigation. So when it comes to our functional tests, when it comes to return to sport for our athletes, there's many tests we can do. You know, we can look at reactive neuromuscular control. We can look at balance tests like the Y test. We can look at isokinetic testing of the quads and the hamstring and making sure that, you know, you're greater than 90% or even 100% limb symmetry on both sides. But I just want to keep it simple here. You know, these tests really incorporate power. They incorporate, you know, single limb strength, balance, um, and you also want to look at the quality of movement. So the first test is the hop test, as you can see in this picture on the top right. We want to have our athletes start, you know, on start and facing um, facing forward, and we want to measure the distance between uh, where they start and where their heel touches. So you're going to have the athlete hop forward with one leg, and you measure the distance on both sides. You want it to be less than 10% difference on both sides, right? What you could also do is take the average of two reps on one leg, you know, take that average, do the two reps on the other leg, take the average, and compare. You know, this has a high ICC value of 0.85. Next test is the crossover test, which we're having our athletes jump in a diagonal pattern. So again, at the, at the end, you want to take the measurement between where they started and their, where their heel lands. And this is going to be a little bit tougher because you're, you're measuring, you know, uh, not only the distance, but we're measuring, you know, side to side kind of uh, control. The last test, I also want to mention that ICC value of 0.96, very high. The last test is the triple jump test, and we're having our athletes jump forward three times on one leg. So when should athletes return? There was a study that was called Young Athletes Who Return to Sport Before Nine Months After ACL Reconstruction have a rate of new injury seven times that of those who delay return. So as I mentioned with the graft healing process, we need to respect the healing process, right? When it comes to rehab and return to sport too early, there's two main concerns. Is the graft going to rupture or is it going to fail? And are we going to damage the rest of the knee? So like I said, the period of remodeling for this graft is where the graft is most at risk. And it seems to correspond to about the 4 to 12 month time point which is when athletes are returning to sport. So yes, if you go back to sport before nine months, you are seven times more likely to have a new rate of injury, right? And particularly when it comes to the hamstring tendon autographs, like I mentioned before, remodeling takes a little bit longer than your patella. So remodeling can take up from 12 to 24 months, that's two years, okay? And which is when the peak of second injury seems to occur. So when it comes to psychology in sports, it's something that has gotten a little bit more popular, you know, a little bit more okay to kind of talk about. As we know, athletes like Kevin Love, DeMar DeRozan, they've been pretty much, you know, they've kind of taken that stigma away from athletics and really made it okay for people to kind of, you know, talk about how they're feeling and the pressures of being an athlete because it's not easy. So mental health among athletes is an important consideration. 65% um, of those patients not returning to play or their sport they really mention a psychological reason for not returning. So when it comes to rehabilitation, yes, we can use our ACA measures, you know, lower extremity functional scales, things like that. But we also want to assess their psychological readiness. You know, they can have the they can have the best rehab knee, they can have the best physical therapist, but if they're psychologically not ready to go back to their sport, then what's the point? What was the point of the rehab? You know, what you know, we have to look at what the patient's goals are. You know, if they want to return to sport, but they're not psychologically ready to do so, then we're not helping them reach their goals. So what what can we do? Well, there's an outcome measure called the ACL RSI. It stands for the ACL, anterior cruciate ligament, return to sport after injury scale. And it looks at the psychological impact of return to sport after this major surgery. So we can use this ACA measure along with the other ACA measures that I mentioned. And, you know, men tend to report a greater self-efficacy post-operatively. So what that means is that they have 
more of that internal, like, I can do this, you know, I can come back. Um, whereas women are self-directed and exhibit greater anxiety concerning an injury's impact on their lives. So just take this into consideration, you know, the difference in between psychology of the female athlete and the male athlete. There are differences that we need to account for. So this is an example of a patient that I've been working with. Um, and this patient did fill out the, a the uh, ACL, you know, psychological outcome measure. As you can see, his responses, you know, he's four months out of surgery. And his responses are really good right now. You know, it's not going to be perfect. You know, it's not going to be 100. But... You can see his, he scores, you know, almost fully confident for most questions. The one question that he scored as zero was, do you find it frustrating to have to consider your knee with respect to your sport? So clearly, you know, if I didn't give him this outcome measure, I would have no idea that he was this frustrated with having to consider his knee when going back to basketball. Like, I, I understand, you know, patients obviously are going to be frustrated, but you know, this person is extremely frustrated. So this is something that we can kind of just bring up, you know, while I'm working on his knee, we can kind of casually bring it up and, you know, kind of just talk about it a little bit, you know, kind of see where he's at, you know, see how he's feeling and maybe just give him a little bit of peace of mind. You know, it's a long process. It does take time. Um, but other than that, his responses were, were pretty good. You know, questions like, are you afraid of accidentally injuring your knee by playing your sport? You know, he answered pretty much not afraid at all. Um, do you think you're likely to re-injure your knee by participating in your sport? You know, almost not likely at all, you know. But this is one person, you know, other, other people could have completely different responses. You know, it might be their second ACL rehab, so they might answer a lot more nervous, in a more nervous manner. So it's just a great tool. It's very quick. It took me, it took him maybe four minutes to fill out after our session. And, you know, he was, he was more than happy to fill it out for me, so... Um, it's something we can monitor as well. I can kind of give them this again, you know, in a month and every month, maybe give it to him and see how his responses change. So when it comes to clinical decision-making in, in regards to return to sport, you know, it's been shown that the mechanical properties of the AC, ACL reconstructed knee joints improve substantially during the phase of ligamentization and reach their final maximum properties at around one year. So really that one year mark tends to be that that sweet spot where I would I would pretty much feel comfortable having our athletes um, return to sport if everything else is okay, you know. Um, we have to respect the, the process of the graft healing. We need to use uh, we need to use a battery of tests, strength tests, hop tests, balance tests, use multiple outcome measures, assess for psychological readiness, collaborate with coaches, with physicians, you know, make sure you know we're on the same page when it comes to our athletes. And use the START framework, which has been validated by research. These are my references. I want to thank you all for your time. Please let me know if you have any questions. You can leave it in the comments or you can send me an email at physiosoto at gmail.com. Have a great night.